نحمد و نسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير الماء ذوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ولا على محمد ولا على سيدنا ولا على سيدنا ولا على محمد بارك الله عليه سلاته وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله We've been talking about the Hajj, and more specifically about the Hajj of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And last week we were talking about the journey back. Uh, and we talked about the stay in Ghadir, Ghadir Qum, where Rasulullah Sallallahu made the announcement in front of everybody, Man kunta mawla, fahadha ali mawla. You know, we went into the background of it and why he did this, and some of the significance of it. You know, the position of Ali is very special, uh, even among the companions of Rasulullah. <laughs> he is not only a companion of Rasulullah, but he is also Ahlul Bayt. So he's from the household as well. Uh, and, you know, if you remember the year before when the Hajj took place, ninth year of Hijri, when Abu Bakr was sent as the Amir of the Hajj or the leader of the Hajj, when the verses came down, regarding you know the, the verses that are now the beginning verses of Surah Tawbah. You know, regarding those, you know, among the Mushrikeen who were still living there that they were given a certain time period and after that they had to leave. Those verses were revealed after Abu Bakr had already left for the Hajj. And so Ali was the one who was chosen to go and recite these verses in front of the people as the tongue of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he arrives, Abu Bakr, he asks him, he says, am I to remove myself from this position and you will become the Amir? He says, no. He says, you are still the Amir and you will give the khutbah, I will simply recite the verses. When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the announcement of Man Kuntu Mawla Fahadha Ali al Mawla that for whomever I am his Mawla, Ali is also his Mawla, the first to congratulate him on this, the first to acknowledge and congratulate Ali Radhan was Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. You know, who immediately stood up and went and hugged Ali radiallahu anhu. He said to him that you are the Mawla of the believing men and the believing women. You know, of all of the believing men and all the believing women. So this was the 18th of Dhil Hajj. And then the journey continued back and they eventually re re uh, reached Medina Munawwara. And they entered uh, Medina Munawwara, you know, saying the dua that Allah, you know, that uh, uh, we worship you and we ask for your forgiveness. And that, uh, you know, our Lord is the one who for all praise is due. So making this dua, they entered the city. I want to go over now a different perspective or a different aspect of the Hajj. You know, everything has its apparent and its hidden meanings. And it's important for us to know both. You know, if you look at previous nations or previous prophets, some of them were given the knowledge of the Sharia only. And then you have other prophets who are given the knowledge of Ilm al only. Rasulullah is given both. He is the master of both. And so those who are his heirs, his true heirs, also deal in both. If you look at the Sharia, the rulings, the Sharia simply deals with what is apparent and provable. Not just apparent, but also provable. 
in the sense that if somebody commits a crime, you have to have the witnesses in order to punish that person. And if it's a crime that asks for four witnesses, all four of the witnesses have to agree on what was done. Even though the person may have committed the crime, but you only have three witnesses, Sharia says that that person goes free. Even though he may have commit, committed it. So it's not provable from a Sharia standpoint. Haqiqat, tariqat, deals with the reality of things. And to understand this, you know, and I recommend everybody, of course, you know, read Surah Kahf. You should be reading it every Friday, but read Surah Kahf and specifically the story of, Ibra of Musa al Islam and Khidr al Islam. And if you read that with an understanding, it starts to open the doors of what reality really is. And that there is no conflict between the Sharia and the reality. Because if you look at what Khizr al Islam did, everything he did, you could justify under the Sharia. It's just that the reasoning behind it wasn't apparent. So this is very important to understand. And this is something we will talk about much more later on, inshallah. The other disclaimer here, you know, before I go into this, because I'm going to talk about the story of Abu Bakr Shibli Rahmatullah. So Abu Bakr Shibli Rahmatullah is the Khalifa of Junaid Baghdadi. Sultan al-Awliya. You know, he's the prince of the friends of Allah. Uh, if you look at Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani, rahmatullahi, he said himself that I am continuing the teachings of Junaid Baghdadi. And there's a direct link there. You know, if you look at the, the, the teachers and the students, there's a direct link. So when we're talking about this, this incident, you know, it's very important to understand this is a very high level spiritual understanding of things. The thing is that we should always set our goal very high. You know, if you set your goal low, uh, you don't really get anywhere. You know, you set it high, and that way if you meet your goal, alhamdulillah, but more than likely you won't meet your goal, but at least you get close to where you're supposed to be. At least there's that yearning to keep moving, keep striving for better, for more. You know, these days, unfortunately, you know, if you look at society now, you know, <coughs> we're supposed to be vertebrates. You know, we're supposed to be animals that have a backbone. Uh, unfortunately, look at most people, most people don't have a backbone anymore. You know, a bunch of invertebrates running around. <coughs> You say something to somebody, oh, his feelings were hurt. If somebody lived during the time of, of Omar, uh, his feelings would always be hurt. Oh, my feelings are hurt, and what's, what's this going to do to my psychology? You know, it used to be, okay, you know, you had a disagreement, you worked it out, and you moved on. Now everybody just dwells on everything. problem is social media because social media you can't let go of anything either everything follows you but most people you know it's like the sheikh who was you know this dude this person comes to me he says you know the dunya has got a hold of me and I want to get out of it and I want to let it go but you know it just won't let me go and the sheikh he was sitting under a tree and he stands up and he grabs onto the tree and he starts yelling to the people, oh, people, let me, uh, you know, help me, help me, this tree has got me. It won't let me go. And the people say, yo, what's wrong with you? Just let it go. What are you talking about? And they says, well, that's what I'm trying to explain to this guy. You know, they're saying the dunya won't let me go, let you let it go. So, one of Abu Bakr Shibli Rahmatullah's students, he went for Hajj. He made the Hajj, he comes back from the Hajj, he comes to his Sheikh, and he tells his Sheikh, you know, very proud that, oh, you know, I've made the Hajj. Sheikh says, very good. Now he starts asking him questions. He says, before you went for Hajj, did you make a very firm and clear intention for the Hajj? 
He said, yes, I did. He said, along with that intention, did you also intend to give up all of those things that you have done since the day you were born that are against the spirit of the Hajj? He says, no, I didn't. He said, well, you really didn't make intention for the Hajj. You know, he's talking to this student. He knows the level of this student. You know, just like when Rasulullah saw some people would ask him, and there were times when two people came and asked him the same question, but he gave different answer to each one, depending on their level of understanding and on their, on their level or their status as far as their, their spiritual status is, to what they could handle. So he's talking to this student. He knows the level of this student and where this student should be. So that's why he's asking him these questions. So he said, no, he said, well, you really didn't make an intention for Hajj. And he says, he says, when you put on the ahram, you know, in the two-piece clothing, he said, when you put on the ahram, did you take off your other clothes? Did you remove your other clothes from you? He said, yes. It's kind of a strange question, because if you're putting on the ahram, you have to remove your clothes before you put the ahram on. He said, yes, I did. He says, so when you did that, did you also remove from yourself everything save Allah, everything except Allah? And he says, no. He said, well, you really didn't remove your clothes then. Point to understand here. You know, this isn't a point that would have had to been explained 500 years ago, but because of the, I guess, the retranslation of the term Tawheed. You know, tawheed in Arabic is a verb. It is the making of one. The way most people throw it around, and especially you know, with the Wahhabi influence everywhere, the way it's thrown around is like a noun, like wahdania, you know, oneness of Allah. That's a noun. Tawheed is the making of one. In spirituality, you know, the first step or the first thing to do is to find a competent sheikh. You know, if you want to go through the field of spirituality, the first step or the first thing is to find a competent sheikh. <clears throat> and then annihilate yourself within the sheikh. You know, so everything you do and everything you say is related to your sheikh. Everything you see, uh, you know, it's like somebody in love. All they can see is their beloved. If the sheikh is truly kamil and the student is truly worthy, then the sheikh takes him to the next level. So initial step is fun of his sheikh, annihilation within the sheikh. Now that sheikh, if he's truly a competent sheikh, you know, if he's truly gone through the, 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 the levels of spirituality, or has that connection with the spirituality, he will take that student to the next level, which is fun of the Rasul. The annihilation within the messenger. Here, there's no question about Rasulullah Sallallahu being Kamil. You know, two words in Arabic that can describe Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are Kamal and Jamal. Perfection and beauty. The Rasulullah is the perfection of beauty, and he is the beauty of perfection. The perfect creator of Allah created his perfect creation and named him Muhammad. So here, if the student is worthy again, the Rasulullah takes him to the next step, which is fana fillah. Annihilation within Allah. So the student now no longer exists. And this, these are very high levels. Again, with the understanding that, that these are our goals, we also understand we will never reach them, but we always strive for them. We never stop striving for that goal. 
here one of two things happens. Either that student is able to absorb that state, or he's not. And if he's not, then he becomes lost. You know, it's still a very high state to be in. Just like Mansur Halaj, rahmatullah But if he's able to absorb it, you know, like Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, now he realizes that all of the focus of his Lord is toward his beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, you read the Qur'an, every aspect of the Qur'an, in one way or another, shows us the greatness of Rasulullah. The love between Allah and Rasulullah. Again, the perfect creator creating the perfect creation and making that creation his beloved. So now, you know, the student's vision returns towards the Rasulullah with the perspective, with a different perspective now. So this is a kind of spirituality in a nutshell. So when he says, did you, did you remove everything from yourself save Allah? You know, today, unfortunately, because in the strange understandings that people have, people think, oh, that excludes Rasulullah. And yet, if you read the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has included Rasulullah so some in every aspect. In his obedience. In his love. The only thing that he's not included is, is worship. We do not worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We worship Allah alone. So when the shaykh is asking, did you remove everything save Allah, this, all of this is understood. Then he asks him, he says, he says, did you cleanse yourself with ghusl and wudu? You know, with the ritual bath and the wudu, did you cleanse yourself in that manner? He said, yes. He says, and did you cleanse yourself of all evils and faults at that time? He says, no. He said, then you did not do a ghusl or wudu. He says, did you, did you call out the labayk? You know, when we go for hajj, we're saying labayk, Allahumma labayk. Labayk literally means here I am. I'm re meaning that I'm re responding to that call. Oh my Lord, I'm here. So he asked him, did you, did you do this? He said, yes. He says, and did you hear a response to that labayk? He says, I heard nothing. He says, then what kind of labayk is this? And you're calling out to your Lord and there's no answer. He said, what kind of labayk is this? Now, if you look historically, there have been incidences where the response has been heard by everyone around. But for most people who hear the response, it's in their hearts. But they still hear that response. He said, did you enter the haram? You know, the haram is the sanctuary, or is the area around Makkah, which is a sanctuary. You know, if you look at the terms, ihram, haram, ha masjid al-haram, all of this is from haram. Because there's so many things that now have become forbidden for you. You know, within the haram, you can't hunt an animal. It is forbidden. You can't cut down a tree. It is forbidden. So many things you can't do. And in the state of ihram, you can't kill a fly. You can't kill any animal. So, so many other things that normally would be lawful are now unlawful. Because of the sanctity of that condition or that place. So, yes, did you enter the haram? He said, yes. He says, and when you entered it, uh, did you uh, make a firm intention of leaving all of those things that you have done that are har or uh, leaving all of, the, all of the actions that are haram forever? He said, no. He said, and you didn't enter the haram. He says, did you visit Makkah? 
said, yes. He says, and when you visited Mecca, when you entered Mecca, did you see the hereafter? You know, if you look at the Hajj, there are many aspects of the Hajj that are literally a reflection of the Day of Judgment. He said, no, I didn't see anything. You know, it used to be, you know, before they commercialized the Hajj, you know, you'd go into Mecca and you'd see the mountains and everything and it's like the awe of Allah was present. You know, like the mountains are about to fall on top of you. Now, of course, you have the clock tower and you have KFC and all the other stuff. You know, it's interesting that the place where you can't cut down a tree, they've cut down all whole mountains. Which is also interesting because this is one of the things that the mushrikeen of, of Quraysh ask Rasulullah. They said that if you are a prophet, then ask your Lord to remove these mountains. You know, they're restricting our space. So what's the difference between their desire and what the Saudi government has fulfilled? Then he, after that he asked him, he says, you know, he says, did you enter the masjid? And the holy masjid, did you enter the masjid? He said, yes. He says, and did you feel the nearness of Allah? He said, no. He said, you didn't enter the masjid. Were you in the presence of the Kaaba? He said, yes. He says, and did you see that entity for which the Kaaba is visited? Rasulullah said to see the Ka to look upon the Kaaba is ibadah. It is the worship of Allah. And the level of ihsan is to worship Allah as though you see him. He said, did you see that entity? He said, no, I didn't see anything. He said, you, you didn't see, you did not look upon the Kaaba then. He said, did you do the Ramal during the Tawaf? You know, the Ramal, the first part of the Tawaf is when you run very, you know, very firmly and, and, and swiftly. <coughs> he said, yes. He said, at that time, did you fear, feel yourself fleeing from the world as, as the, in, in such a way that you had <coughs> left the world completely? He said, no. He said, you didn't do it on then. Did you place your hands on the black stone and kiss it? Yes. And then the sheikh, he lets out this sigh. Ah. He says, woe unto you. For Rasulullah has said that whoever places his hands on the black stone is as if one who is shake, shakes hands with Allah. And whoever shakes the hand of Allah has entered, has become safe from all things. Did you feel anything of that security at that moment? He said, no. He said, then you didn't place your hands on the black stone or kiss it. Interesting thing about the black stone, very famous narration which, you know, even when you go for Hajj or for Umrah, you land and they ask which language you speak and they give you 50 books in that language. Uh, or like the brother here, they sometimes give you books in other languages. Uh, so, and one of the hadiths they quote in, in, in that book is where Umar Radim is standing in line to kiss the black stone. And during the Hajj, you know, this pushing and, and pulling is all haram. But Rasulullah Sussam, you know, said this is like you're killing yourself, it's suicide. You know, if you look at you know, the Hajj the way it should be, there's no pushing and pulling. So everything is in order. So Omar Radhi was standing, waiting to kiss the black stone. And then when he arrives at the black stone, he says to the black stone, he says, Oh stone, 
O black stone, Hajar Aswad, I know that you are only a stone, and that you cannot benefit me or harm me, and if I had not seen Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kissing you, I would never have kissed you. So this is this is the part of the hadith that you get in those books. Which if you look at the whole narration, this is only half the narration. And we then say, oh, you know, we should do exactly as the Rasulullah ordered, which is which is true. But there is also a methodology and reasoning behind things. Ali radiallahu standing behind Omar radiallahu and he says to Omar, he says, oh, Omar, don't say this, don't say like this, because I have heard Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that this black stone, Hajar Aswad, on the day of judgment will benefit some and and harm others. Some will get benefit from it, and others will be harmed by it. Because on that day, it will testify to the ones who came before it with Iman and also testify against those who came with before it without Iman. Again, as we've been talking about before, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives something a characteristic or a quality, to deny that quality is also a form of kufr. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this authority to this stone, then to deny that authority is also a form of kufr. And so Omar Radion immediately he says that I, I uh, repent from what I have said. Which is also interesting because this also tells us that there will be those who go before it with Iman and there will also be those who go before it without Iman. So both, both types of people have to go. Then he asked, he says, did you make two salat at Maqam Ibrahim? He says, yes. He says, at that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had placed you at a very speci uh, special position and, and rank. And did you do that which is required from that position? He says, I didn't do anything. He says, then you didn't make two salat two, or two rakat at Maqam Ibrahim. You know, if you understand what Maqam Ibrahim is, you know, Maqam Ibrahim, from the parent, parent state, is that stone which Ibrahim al-Islam used to stand upon. You know, Ismail al-Islam would hand the stones to Ibrahim al-Islam who would place them in their position as he was building the Kaaba. When the walls became high, Ismail al-Islam brings this stone to his father, so now the, Ibrahim al-Islam stands on that stone and places the stones in the higher positions. Upon that stone is the footprint of Ibrahim al-Islam, even today. Recently they, they've outlined it with some silver lining, but it's still there. This is one of the miracles of all the prophets, that when they wanted to, even the hard stones would give way under them. And when they didn't want to, not even the soft ground would bear their prints. The other interesting thing is that the stone knew where to move. This is that connection with Ibrahim salam. That transfer of, of knowledge. So it knew where he wanted to be. And it would move wherever he needed to go. But maqam is also status. So if you look at the maqam of Ibrahim salam, in order to understand the maqam of Ibrahim salam. We have to look at the story of him being thrown into the fire. You know, when he's being thrown into the fire, and I have a little time, so I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. And we'll continue from here next week, inshallah. When he's being thrown into the fire, you know, Jibreel al-Islam comes, you know, all the angels are up in arms. And he comes, he says, I've come to help you. He said, did Allah command you? He said, no, I asked permission and I came. He said, I don't need you. People say, oh, this means that you only ask from Allah. But then the question is, where in the Quran or even in a hadith that can you tell me what dua that Ibrahim al-Islam made? He didn't make any dua. 
He didn't say, oh, Allah, save me from this. Complete reliance on Allah is a characteristic of all, of all the prophets. <laughs> Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us something special from Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, because they, they'll say, oh, see, this, this story shows us that you only ask for Allah, from Allah. Of course, what they mean from that are other things, and I won't get into what they mean from, from that. But that's not what the story is telling us, because there is no dua that Ibrahim alayhi salam made. The maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam is that he is, he is pleased with the pleasure of Allah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with him being thrown into the fire, he was pleased with being thrown into the fire. All he asked Jibreel is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looking upon me? Is he seeing me? Of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking upon everything. He sees everything. But that's not what the question was. The question was, is he seeing me with his pleasure? Is he looking upon me with his pleasure? And that's all that matters. So whatever condition I am in, I am pleased with Allah. This is the maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam. I'll end here today, inshallah. We'll continue from here next week. Uh, continuing to talk about this conversation between Abu Bakr Shibli rahmatullahi and his student uh, regarding the hajj, inshallah. Uh, and, you know, we haven't even gotten to the real part of the hajj, which is Arafat. Uh, so, Inshallah, we'll, we'll maybe get to that point next week, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love. Uh, whoever has not made sunnah, go and make sunnah, inshallah.